Hello everybody, so it's 8.30, um, we're going to get started. My name's Shola here from ITRL um, and uh, I'd like to wish you all a warm welcome and the people watching on the live stream as well to our breakfast seminar today. Um, <coughs> for those of you who haven't already been here, uh, the fire exit is the door you came in from or if you happen to be downstairs there's a green sign down to the end of the corridor and right. If you're looking for a toilet, it's down the staircase there and on your right hand side. Um, so <clears throat> today we're going to have uh, Albin and Gyoso presenting uh, future scenarios for the digitalized freight transport sector. Uh, but before we get started, just want to uh, tell you about a couple of things. Uh, so uh, the uh, SIT19 conference on integrated transport is coming up in a few weeks and we've uh, opened late registration, or it will open today in the afternoon, uh, <coughs> for non-contributing members. So that might be something that some of you are interested in. So um, you can talk to anybody that works here at ITRL or go onto our website under events and look at CIT uh, and register there if you're interested. Um, yes, and uh, now I'd like to uh, pass over to Alvin and Gyoso. Um, sorry, one more thing I forgot. We actually have one more breakfast seminar coming up in two weeks from now. Sorry? Oh, okay, it's next week, isn't yes. it? Sorry, my fault. Um, so um, you can go onto our website under events and uh, register there for that. Okay, Alvin, Kyoza. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, very nice to have you all here and for you on the web streaming. Hope there's some people there as well. <laughs> uh, my name is Alvin Engholm. I'm a PhD student here at ITRL. Um, me, Gyoza. Jonas, who we'll also have in the room, down in the, in the sofa. Uh, Marie Bemer from Skania, and also a PhD student at Handelshögskola. Um, and Katarina Stettler, Erik Herngren, and Anna Pernestol from ITRL, who is actually right now live down in Gothenburg presenting this same presentation in parallel. So we're living in two parallel worlds, two parallel presentations <laughs> of the same conference. It's pretty nice. Uh, so we have been the main team working on um, uh, developing the scenarios, it's being just presenting, but all of us have been contributing equally much. And then we have also done this together with a big team of uh, experts from the transport sector and freight transport sector. Uh, we'll go a bit more into detail than that, but it's really a joint effort to create these scenarios. And what we will present to you today is not, I would say, a fully finalized uh, material. It's still a work in progress. We hope to finalize this project in the uh, beginning of the autumn and also published the final report then. So it's still a bit preliminary and we're still working and massaging the content because we've got a lot of, lot of input from all the participants. Um, so that might, uh, yeah, it's good to know that it's still work in progress. Um, this project has been run by us at ITRL together with Scania, Carries Future and Closer. And we have got funding from Dry Sweden for this. So, <coughs> um, the main motivation for this is that, as you know, we have a big sustainability challenge within the transport sector. The Swedish Transport Agency has a target of reducing climate emissions by 70% until 2030. The result of last year's transport emissions is that we increased the emissions from the Swedish transport system with 0.5%. It's not a big increase, but everything that is an increase is a big failure. The main... Oh, sorry. Let me finish. Okay. <laughs> Um, the main reason for this is that we increased um, truck volumes, truck, um, truck traffic. So the heavy truck traffic is responsible for this net increase, you could say, a bit simplified. And this is also Traffic Verket's conclusion in their report on this. So the growing volumes of, of um, road uh, demand of road transport um, is in some sense problematic from a climate sustainability perspective at least. And we are extremely dependent on truck transport, road freight transport in Sweden. 88% um, of the ton kilometers of domestically transported goods in Sweden is done by road transport, so by trucks. Um, the truck traffic has increased quite drastically, so plus 38% in 2018 compared with 1990. The prognosis, uh, generally speaking of, of freight volumes in Sweden, is that we will have a 67% increase uh, 2040 um, compared to 2012. So we need to manage this massive expected um, growth in demand <coughs> while also meeting the sustainability targets. 
this is also a picture we have borrowed from Tafik Verket, who have published an excellent report on this. This show the total climate emissions from the transport sector over time. So we have seen a trend in decrease here. However, the, the um, prognosticized um, growth in traffic volumes uh, will follow this line of emissions. With the current policies in place, it's expected or prognosticized that we might reach around half of our target until 2040, which is zero emissions. This means that this other chunk here, we don't really know how to solve yet. One solution is to reduce the traffic volumes, transport volumes. Not very, what should I say, politically attractive maybe to suggest that. Um, other solutions might be different forms of new digital solutions, new alternative fuels, more efficient transport, etc. And that is what we wanted to explore with this project. So there are a lot of, lot of trends coming up now affecting um, freight transport. We have had a big um, bus around self-driving cars for some time now, self-driving vehicles. That's definitely a trend, but more in general, we have all these um, aspects of digitalization that will impact somehow the freight transport sector. However, there are still, as you know, vast uncertainties around this. Um, both, how will this impact our everyday life, consumer behavior, um, how will it impact e-commerce and our purchasing habits, how will it impact the business landscape, what vehicle technologies are used, what vehicle technologies are possible, um, also what policies are possible to do. Maybe digitalization can enable dynamic um, kilometer taxes, for instance, that are differentiated over time per day, or what type of vehicle they drive. So this has I mean, of course, digitalization will have impacts on many, many different layers and in many different ways. Um, but as you kind of hear when I speak about it, it's highly uncertain, right? It's super difficult to predict what will happen. And we think that it's not a big, or the whole idea of this project is that there's not an idea to, to prognosticize one future. So we need to look at this and see, okay, what could happen? There's a broad span of opportunities here. Let's try to somehow systematically find out what are the different potential futures with digitalization and the freight transport sector. So that's what is what this scenario work is about. Um, and the idea has been to develop these scenarios together with the industry, together with um, not just industry, but also public partners and all the actors that are somehow related to freight transport. Um, so we together have a joint idea of this and also then can use these scenarios in the internal organizations and by the respective actors um, but it's mainly like food for thought and, and then as a tool for the participants and, and all you others that weren't involved to then take this information go home to your organizations and use this as a strategic tool to start thinking about <coughs> how, how should we adapt to this future or to that future or that future so that's a little bit on the on the background and why we wanted to do this um, when you're working with scenarios, there are different um, methodologies and strategies that you can have. And one way to start thinking about how you should address this is to think of what is the main type of question we would like to ask. So this is a quite good, I would say, um, typology of different scenario methodologies. So you have predictive scenarios, which could be forecast or what-if analysis. This is focused on answering the question, what will happen? This type of scenarios fit when we have a kind of relatively certain development. We think that we can prognosticize the future pretty good by looking on historical data and past experience. And then one way or another extrapolate that or use causal models to build conclusions about the future. <coughs> then on the right hand here of the spectrum, we have something called normative scenarios. Um, that is more okay. If we have a specific goal, one could, for instance, use this uh, transport climate goal that we have. So reduce emissions by 70% until 2030. So we are here today, we want to go here. What are the different paths we can take to get there? So that's a completely different type of approach. Then you ask, okay, how can we meet this target? Not what will happen if the future or if the future continues as the past. And then finally, we have this middle section here, which is the type of method we have used today. And that's much more explorative, what could happen. So here we assume that okay, the future is more or less by definition uncertain. 
and we want to understand okay what could happen so there you do develop different scenarios you try out different alternative worlds or alternative futures with the purpose of understand the kind of span of future solutions that you could have so not trying to find the most likely one not trying to find the most uh, the, the one that's most attractive but trying to find the different futures that we might end up in in order to prepare ourselves for different future and different types of futures um, and we have used something called the intuitive logic <coughs> method so it can be understood that we have oh it is green here but it doesn't really say it. it's a green box here <laughs> it's too light in here so from the present state we will have certain trends acting towards the future and we can say we have a stage a backdrop here which is the future development that we can expect reasonably accurate to, to happen nonetheless on top of them of that then we have uncertainties so with this method you use two different uncertainties like across here so on top of these certain developments and these developments and these trends can be I mean, change the world very much for instance unexpected growth in transport volumes of 60 percent that's a drastic change for today but it's still a rather certain development but then on top of that we have uncertainties and this yields us four different scenarios so this is what we have done. We have, we have together with the experts, uh, analyzed what trends do we expect to be quite, quite certain and what are the main uncertainties and how does the different scenarios play out depending on how these uh, uncertainties happen. These are the companies and, and actors that helped us with this. Uh, it was really fun doing this. We met a lot of very, very interesting people. Some of you are sitting in this room today. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to everyone who participated. It wouldn't have been uh, possible and good if, if you hadn't participated. So we have everything from uh, KTH, Gamia, Closer, Einride, Stockholm Stad, Botrike Kommun, Trafikverket, vehicle manufacturers, municipalities, uh, public authorities, uh, large and small companies in the logistics sector. And that was also the idea, to mix all these different perspectives and get the input from, from different types of, of actors. So the first step in this process is that we had a workshop. We brought 30, 40 people there from these companies and we asked them, what trends do you see acting on the dig digitalization trends do you see acting on the freight transport landscape? So we got a lot of trends and we asked them all participants to okay please group these trends on how uncertain is the trend is it certain that it will happen and how it will play out or is it highly uncertain and then we also asked them to judge how big impact could this trend have on the transport system will it have a small impact or a large impact so the small impact trends might be important especially for some actors but we said we skip them for now and then we keep certain trends with a big impact. One example here is increase in e-commerce. This will have a big impact on the freight transport system, but it's quite certain that it will happen. And then we have the uncertain trends, but that are important. So for instance, open data sharing becomes norm. Um, so these are the trends that then represent this green backdrop, the stage that we we'll believe will happen in the future. And these are uncertainties. And this slide okay. looks a bit weird. Yes, <laughs> it looks a bit weird, but I'll try to explain it. So basically, we try to look at the certain development and we try to look at the context. And uh, in terms of these developments, we identified context in urban planning. Uh, we identified context in terms of data and technology, context in terms of policy and politics, as well as consumer uh, opinions. And then also how these trends actually manifest themselves in uh, the freight transport domain. So for example, in urban planning, you see that urbanization and regionalization trend uh, that is ongoing and that is certain. We have a space is a challenge trend and so on. So it's a bit difficult to sort of go through all of them, but the report kind of explains all of them, uh, explains all of them. And quite a lot of them are sort of known to everybody uh, in the sector or in society. Uh, in terms of uh, freight transport, these manifest themselves. So for example, 
for urban planning. Uh, we see uh, trends towards uh, data-driven optimization and planning methods. Uh, we see also uh, trends in uh, politics and policy, for example, uh, requirements on local environment emissions and things like that. Uh, we see uh, return based flows included in the distribution uh, uh, flows. Uh, we see also consumer opinion trends, such as demand for uh, transport tailored after the needs, and as well as data technologies. We see uh, that not only vehicles are tracked or certain shipments are tracked, but now goods pallets, uh, storage, uh, so basically all components that are facilitating or that are the object of uh, transportation are being tracked and they are all connected. Uh, and we also see that there is digitization of logistics data and um, other trends such as uh, drivers, vehicles are also uh, part of this digitization trend. Um, perhaps uh, one of the main drivers also as an external uh, set is the e-commerce increase, uh, possibilities in VR, AR and uh, mixed reality approaches uh, as they increase in quality, this actually can actually replace uh, transportation uh, needs. Uh, yes, so these are basically the certain developments. And then we looked at strategic uncertainties and we have identified a number of them and uh, part of the through the workshops and uh, part of the analysis group was to sort of uh, groups work was to sort of sort out these trends and try to find uh, trends that uh, or uncertainties that somehow uh, we feel are important and uh, somehow they co-vary with one another. So one type of trend that we identified is along uh, climate change and we kind of identify uncertainties uh, starting from uh, general uh, aspects to towards more specific transport related aspects. So one uncertainty was uh, climate change in terms of ur urgency, how urgent it is, whether it is really in focus or uh, there's just a significant concern about it, but this is just one of many concerns. Uh, then we have identified slightly more uh, sort of actionable uh, uncertainties, how people will act on these, uh, how people will act on these uh, uh, urgency of climate change. Uh, finally, we looked at uh, also an uncertainty in terms of sustainability as a paradigm, whether it will uh, sort of uh, be one of many important um, priorities or <coughs> it will be the priority in the future. Uh, and then also looked at some uh, uncertainties in terms of goods transports uh, and looked at consequences. So, for example, in these uh, scenarios, we see existing uh, operations and uh, structures being optimized uh, uh, using different digitization and uh, different kinds of technologies. Versus here, we see a completely new sustainability paradigm. Uh, uh, yes. So this is one of the uncertainties and that, okay. Uh, and based on these uncertainties, if we select the one that was the, in the middle, how, how, how much is sustainability in focus? Uh, we can sort of see two types of alternative uh, scenarios. Ones that slightly improve uh, slide, uh, sustainability. So we basically keep the same lifestyle and we have some focus on sustainability, but it's just one of many, uh, one of many criteria. Uh, versus, we have a new word in one of the scenarios where we actually transform the word into a green word, where you have completely new uh, logic, uh, sort of driving the environment. So you have new levels of circularity, significant decrease in product consumption. Um, material circulation, local solutions, for example, for circular economy and so on. The other set of uncertainties that we looked at uh, that were also clustered were uh, the attitudes uh, towards uh, information, uh, information sharing as well as any kind of effects on this in terms of business, uh, business models or operations. So 
uh, on the top level, uh, we have a societal attitude towards, uh, or societal attitude generally. We are uh, low trust versus high trust. Uh, then, in terms of uh, organizational structure, we on one end we see uh, industrial linear logic, on the other end we see a network logic, which I will explain a little bit later. Uh, and then these correspond to uh, in-house optimization possibilities versus system level optimizations. Uh, <coughs> in terms of willingness to share data, uh, in these scenarios that are probably more in terms of this linear inner uh, logic, you have restrictive data sharing mostly based on strategic alliances versus in another end of the spectrum, you have the open trusted based data sharing. Uh, and then this also manifests itself in the business logics of the, of the freight. So here you have basically the current logic where you kind of uh, use some moderate data sharing to optimize operations, versus here you have a completely new logic where you uh, don't really have system boundaries, uh, which is actually corresponding this uh, network structure. This is actually illustrated here in terms of these, uh, this set of, sorry, set of, uh, uh, in, the, in these two types of organizational structures. One is a top-down structure that has a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, you have detailed instructions based on which uh, individuals are sort of performing operations. Things are operated mostly in silos versus you have the network structure where um, basically organizations uh, grow organically and the uh, teams are assembled uh, based on uh, capabilities and need uh, quite dynamically and they sort of can utilize uh, possibilities that are enabled by digitization to a lot larger degree. So based on this we have identified this cross that Albin was presenting where you have uh, on one axis you have this variance in terms of uh, how important is sustainability where it's in completely defocus versus one of the important criteria and uh, what type of organizational uh, structures we have and how we share data in these two scenarios. So you have industrial organization with limited strategic data sharing and you have network organization with comprehensive data sharing. Yes. Okay, so that is uh, made it sound a bit like uh, fluffy and abstract, but <coughs> we believe that these are the m some of the most uncertain trends that will have a big impact. So this is the illustration of one of the scenarios. So welcome to 2035, 2040, sometime there. That's the time frame we have chosen. The years are, are not, the mo it's not very important, but let's say around 20 years from now. So now we are in the, the lower left end of the scenario cross, which means that we are in a world where we have basically the same industrial way of organizing uh, the freight transport sector. We have limited but strategic data sharing amongst our partners because we live in a partnership society here. And we have a strong sustainability focus, but it's not very directed toward climate. It's, it's more in general, these three pillars of sustainability. <coughs> so one could say that, okay, this is the business usual scenario. This is maybe the scenario that's most like the world we live in today. Um, and in some aspect it is, but it also we have had all of these certain trends that just listed that have been acting on us since today, so in 20 years. So a lot of things have actually changed. Um, so what happened here is that during the 1920s, at the time we live in now, a lot of new actors tried to enter uh, the logistics and freight sector. Both actors with uh, new vehicle solutions, new transport concepts, but also specialized uh, logistics actors, just platform companies. But how it turned out was that the big existing players that already had uh, in-house big um, access to big data sets in-house, and it also had a presence, strong presence on the market, were the ones more generally actually succeeding here. So the landscape and the business landscape is ra rather stable. What also happened leading into this world is that we had a big economic crisis in 2022. 
and with the economic crisis the whole Paris Agreement was kind of forgotten. We can't focus so much on, we can't do things that threaten uh, the economic viability of the current system. And that has led to kind of a world where, yeah, the, the economy works basically like it does today. Um, the global and regional um, long distance um, trade is bigger than ever here. It has grown significantly from today. So we have higher long distance flows here which means that Sweden has bigger import and export flows than today. Swedish products and raw materials are still very attractive on the global market. Um, that's kind of visualized here in the background. It's maybe a bit difficult to see, but we still have this really high volume flows, long distance flows. You see here this person that access some IoT data well, the whole I IoT bubble that we have now, that we see now, and we kind of believe will explode, had some major setbacks in this scenario. It turned out that around in, in uh, 2020s, that it was really hard to ensure security. So data issues were really, really top priority, and that's halted down the development of, of open shared IoT data. And that led to that the big uh, volumes of data that you could actually access was restricted within big organizations and within clusters of organizations. So in this world, we see that the big, some, some OEMs have partnered with big logistic companies, uh, with, with service providers, and they have formed clusters where they have their own, own platforms uh, for data sharing. They do share data to, to improve business, but it's done within a kind of a, not really a silo, but still a confined partnership-based um, data sharing. This has led to several improvements of, of freight transport. Uh, it has enabled uh, higher field rates and higher efficiencies in general in those flows. But there's not much of cross-collaboration, horizontal collaboration, because everything is done within these big partnerships. So within the partnerships, we have highly efficient transport solutions and very efficient logistical solutions. But it's not very much of this, this cross-actor collaboration in that sense. Another impact of this is that the access to IoT data, especially for, um, have made it possible for, for big transport buyers and especially for, for public transport buyers, which are one of the most important transport buyers today, to very detailed follow up on their uh, requirements and the procurements. So this has led to a very high, high data driven um, uh, control over your transport services that you purchase, which has put much higher requirements <coughs> on the transport operators than today. Um, another thing in this scenario, which is not very visible in the picture, but is, is, is very important, is that self-driving, ooh, um, self-driving vehicles had, had, had its entrance here. Um, not everywhere, but on highways and longer distance uh, flows where we have big volume self-driving vehicles has really been introduced and that has challenged quite a lot the industry for the transport operators and the holders so on some important strategical links in this scenario we have self-driving flows of vehicles and that is starting now in 2030 2035 to really really challenge the sector but it has not yet had a very big impact because technology is quite limited so that, that's that scenario down here left low data sharing industrial organization Sustainability one of the priorities, and it's a more more efficient transport system, but in the big picture, it hasn't changed that much. It's quite similar to today. Another way we have tried to visualize this, uh, bear with us here. It's maybe a bit complicated picture, but if we think of a typical uh, logistics chain here, we have the first step with raw material transport, then we have the second step with some kind of product transport, and then the last deliver to customer. That's the kind of traditional linear logistical uh, chain. Then we also here try to illustrate that we have one type of flow which is circulation between customers. So when we, in the sharing economy, when we'll s share our drilling machines or, or products peer to peer between customers. And then we have recycle flows when we recycle products and material recycling here. What we try to illustrate here is that these thick arrows are the most important flows here. So that says that we still have a quite traditional supply chain.
production and logistics, we still uh, prefer to buy new products. We don't have uh, any emergence of a big part of sharing economy. Um, so this local peer-to-peer -peer transport is not a very significant part of transport. It's still dominated by, by heavy long flows of raw materials due to the strong import and export business, but also since we continue to, to consume new products. And we have a general quite big demand here of, of transport. And we are working on putting some numbers on this, and that will be in the, in the final report, but we are still kind of working with this but to, to try to estimate how big this growth in volume will be. Okay. Uh, all right. You're a bit out of phase here. Um, yeah, so in this scenario, uh, which we call basing data, basing in data, uh, we have basically, as we have discussed, uh, a network uh, organization structure, and we have extended uh, data sharing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, sustainability is just one of the key uh, components. And in this scenario, uh, we see that driven by the poor economy, we wanted to sort of... Uh, uh, through digitization uh, actually achieve growth. So actors, for example, in the train uh, industry, through data-driven approaches, use predictive maintenance <laughs> methods to sort of uh, make uh, transportation or parts of transportation more uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, this requires, obviously, large amounts of data sharing. It's usually not just one actor that has the data. and uh, the scenario sort of allows for this. Uh, we have uh, new collaborations basically in form of this in terms of data sharing. We also see that you through these data-driven approaches we see a better use of the infrastructure. Um, we see new services. These new services are mostly towards the uh, this recycled uh, or sort of the uh, sharing of uh, products and, uh, and, and the sharing and reusing of products between uh, end users uh, are types of new services that we see here. And we have uh, still, through the data sharing, uh, we can enable a lot of uh, new services there where the convenience is in focus. Okay? So, for example, you want to have shorter delivery time. Uh, also in this scenario, we see that uh, there are new actors that are actually present in this ecosystem of transportation. So that on one hand, there are actors that own a lot of data that are not necessarily thought of as uh, transport, uh, uh, transport actors, but for example, uh, uh, data owners that know about consumptions and, and users uh, and uh, society at large, such as uh, Google and, and Facebook, etc. Uh, these actors we have already seen now that they are actually looking into uh, logistics as, and they are creating not only data sharing platforms and uh, providing their data but they're already starting to uh, sort of build building blocks for transport operations and logistics operations. They will provide these building blocks and uh, anyone essentially will be able to uh, create logistics companies at very little cost and uh, hinder. So there will be uh, new small companies that have no vehicles, no uh, storage area, no uh, uh, drivers, uh, or or access to uh, access to uh, fuel. They will actually get this as a service, and they will be able to sort of uh, combine this. Uh, all these uh, services into uh, a, a niche uh, transport um, provision. Uh, yes, so that's basically the scenario for this. Here, here we also see that there will be some changes in terms of uh, flows. So here, <coughs> the circulation between customers with these new services that I mentioned will be more uh, dominant. There will be also quite a lot of flows uh, that are from recycling products. So here it's not between peer-to-peer uh, -peer customers, but sort of a new industry is sort of enhanced and created for recycling products and then <coughs> shipping it back to the customers. Uh, but we also see uh, some flows in terms of recycling materials. 
All right, so we take the leap from down in the right where we have this consumer focused scenario and go up to the top right corner <coughs> where we have the green circle. Uh, so we live in a world where climate sustainability is the top priority and where we have this network based quite openly data sharing which has changed the business structure. And it's quite fun because when we were in the expert team um, together with Jonas and more, we said, oh, this scenario, when we propose this to the, to the big expert group, it will be kind of, kind of biased because everyone would like to live in this world. But then we, and, and everyone would prefer this scenario, and that's not really how it should be. But then when we started working with this scenario, we realized that, no, this is probably not at all attractive from all, all angles. And I will try to explain that to you now. So what happened here and, and how we came into this world is that it became quite obvious that the effects of climate change were too too um, strong to not take concrete action on. So the EU pushed some really strong legislations to actually follow up on the agreements that we have in place. Um, and the UN nation also kind of side into this. And what enabled this shift was actually to a large extent digitalization and digital um, labels and products where you could actually track the whole footprint of products from origin to consumption. So you could track the whole phase, the whole life cycle of a product transparently with real data, which of course requires safe data sharing and uh, new technologies. Blockchain is one of the technologies that has been used for this extensively in the scenario. Another very, very important um, uh, part of this story is the election in 2026 in Sweden. One of the big parties went to the election and said that if we should reach our climate goals and our sustainability goals, network-based organization is the way to do it. So what was decided was that all public authorities need to share their data. And we will also, as uh, the government support um, and make investments in, or at least financially somehow support logistics platforms and data platforms and enable and, and make sure that logistics and transport data are accessible in an open and safe way. So the public sector took, took initiative to really set the framework and make sure that this happened. <coughs> um, this little person here sitting with the bike represent that in this world, it's become big business to repair and maintain old things and to use products as much as you can for as long as you can. That also means that products need to circulate much more among end users. So instead of that, that I buy a product and then go to the, to the waste s station with it, I, I will pass it on and sell it. So block it like companies are the big, big, big winners in this. But this also creates a huge demand for urban based mainly, but also in the rural areas, micro transport. Where we need to transport and circulate all of this product in a very efficient way. And that's a huge challenge because <coughs> you don't have these uh, boxy, nice packaged uh, IKEA uh, boxes to move. You should move an already mounted bike or a big kitchen table or a sofa or small, small electronic devices in a safe, cost efficient way. And the way to make this possible and, and able to really optimize this is through using AI tools and data driven applications. Um, This whole transition also was pushed by by introducing taxes on new materials, on raw materials. So there was introduced a kind of bonus model system for um, reducing the need of new new materials and really, really pushing for, for this circulation. So all of these trends has, has together acted on this. Um, the heavy transport that there is still exists it's done in a very multimodal way, but the big change from a transport perspective is that the need for these urban vehicles, small vehicles that can take care of all of the circulation. And that has led to the, the rise of multi-purpose electric vehicles, um, which are multi-purpose in the sense that they can transport both people and passengers and are modular. So you can have a, uh, an electronic uh, bottom plate with, with uh, the drivetrain and the navigation capabilities. And then you have different modules that you place on top. So a passenger module or a freight module. And it's then, and they are um, 
some extent or in some areas autonomous and will take care of this, this product circulation in a cost efficient way. Um, a very important new type of actor in the business ecosystem here is the logistic platform provider and, and the service provider that can then handle all these microtransactions. Um, and this led to a boom in the log tech sector. It's a completely new sector that has grown up and became huge. So the companies that can provide these services are, are operating without any, they're not the traditional logistic companies, they're not the vehicle manufacturers. These are completely new actors who only specialize in, in meeting, matching supply and demand for these microtransactions. <coughs> So what has happened here, if we look on the flows and the transport volumes, is that the long distance uh, heavy flows, we still have a small increase compared to today because we have this general population growth, uh, but it's still a relative decrease. So per capita, it's much lower, which also is seen in the product search here. However, we have a quite big circulation of products, both that are recycled, so that goes back to some kind of, of warehouse or, or uh, um, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, seller or, or store. But especially this circulation between customers is really, really big. So this is where the big money is, and also where the big new opportunities for, for companies in the, in the freight transport sector. So to optimize and offer services here. But this also puts a lot of strain, of course, on the cities because we have a huge amount of, of products that should be moved. So much more movement of goods here. And we also see that this focus on, on uh, with all these new taxes and incentives is also creating some social tensions because this is not really good for all. It's good for some, but it really, it, it doesn't fit everyone. So we also have a lot of social tensions in this scenario. Ooh. Oops, I talked too long. <laughs> Okay, so in this scenario, which we entitled Next Generation Social Engineering, or the Swedish Folk Hemat 2.0, <laughs> uh, we basically have, uh, as we explained earlier, we have a very strong focus. Our, the primary focus is sustainability, and uh, we have limited data sharing. Mostly big actors are still holding the data, and for strategic purposes, they are sharing this information. Um, so in this scenario, we have... Uh, Everybody understands the effects of climate change, and it's uh, um, the even the capital investments uh, are so uh, are uh, sort of uh, threatened, and because of this, uh, uh, even very sort of today perhaps questionable policy uh, could be actually carried out. So uh, there are very strong uh, taxation on different kinds of. Uh, diesel and the uh, and, uh, benzene uh, prices, or diesel and benzene, there's a, a sort of a incentive to electrify and uh, use electric transportation. Uh, there's also, <coughs> uh, so these, this is sort of the general scenario. Uh, within this, we see that there are different kinds of bonus malus uh, type of uh, activity, uh, sort of incentives. Uh, as a result of this, we see, for example, that uh, prices for uh, flying, which is shown here, are skyrocketed. Uh, and organizations have, uh, business organizations have understood this, and they are replacing the need for transportation in terms of VR and so on. Um, we, as consumers, we also understand the importance of climate change and we value it very much, but we are very ver not very willing to actually change uh, our behavior, consumption behavior. What we instead uh, sort of expect is that companies that own the data, that have a chance of sort of create uh, new innovations and uh, optimize transportation, they should have sustainability in focus and they should optimize and, and sort of reach uh, our targets. 
uh, we use digitization in this uh, scenario in uh, different kinds of nudging uh, systems. We uh, sort of enhance digitization, use digitization for circular <coughs> economic uh, circular economic solutions. Um, we uh, also have a new market for uh, biodegradable materials, uh, which actually has an effect, of effect on transportation. So both in terms of uh, fuel, alternative fuel, as well as uh, different kinds of raw material uh, transport, both within and export transport to other parts of the world in terms of biodegradable fuels, as well as biodegradable materials. Um, there is, even in this scenario, even though uh, we understand the value of data sharing and everybody uh, sort of uh, agrees that it has to be uh, shared, there's, uh, there's a weak uh, willingness to share data. And this is fueled by uh, basically the, the Chinese social system that uh, extended uh, its, its presence to a larger part of the world. And there have been some scandals in terms of privacy threats and, uh, and so on. Um, nonetheless, the government, uh, in order to reach the sustainability goal, has managed to push through the policies to enable the data sharing that is necessary to guarantee the follow-up uh, on the targets. So uh, follow-up in terms of CO2 emissions or uh, filling rates and so on for transport. The <coughs> Yes, um, and uh, perhaps in terms of the transport industry, as I said, in this scenario, we still have uh, the big actors that realize the value of the data, uh, and they form strategic alliances uh, to uh, sort of optimize the transportation. So we don't have this uh, very wide and very open data sharing. So. Um, In terms of, sorry, in terms of uh, data flows, we have actually in this scenario, less prominent uh, circular, uh, uh, cir circular transportation flows between customers, so peer to peer. We have some recycling, but mostly we have recycling of materials uh, as a big uh, data flow. So this will actually increase the, uh, also the flows here uh, from uh, production. So the raw materials, obviously, <coughs> since a lot of the materials are uh, sort of reused, uh, there the flows are decreasing. Yes. Think. Uh, yes. So those were the scenarios so far. Um, as you saw and, and heard now, we mainly talked about the worlds, the different worlds, and how that might impact a little bit on the freight transport sector. We are working now with kind of tailoring out more in specifics. How will this actually impact freight transport and the actors and the ones of you are sitting here? And that will be available in the report that you can read in September. Uh, there is a draft version here, still in black and white. So in September you will get the colored version <laughs> and the full version, of course, with, with all these uh, little things. Um, <coughs> yet again, big thanks to the partners and our funding partner, Just Freedom. Uh, and please, questions, comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, perhaps one more comment on the report. So we have a draft version. It was extremely challenging to actually summarize the report. It has so many valuable, uh, detailed information. So, you know, look forward to it, to, you know, use it in your organization because, yeah. Thank you, Kiosa and Alvin. Um, so now we're gonna have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, to people watching on Facebook, we also have questions there. So if you have a question, please uh, type it in the comments in the video. And um, if we can't get to it now, we'll try and write you a response after the seminar. So, questions. Um, could you go back to, to the, uh, the uh, we call it the, uh, where, we, where we talked about the consumption and in increasing in the This one, yeah. yeah. One on I really like this one. Explanation of what as actually happens because we can kind of see what happens to the different like transport sectors or transport segments or whatever. 
Um, but, the, but, but something I'm a bit curious about is number three here. Um, the, the consumption. Uh, did you discuss any scenarios or like uncertainties of consumption? Like for, for example, a, a decrease in the demand for consumption? Mm. Yes, uh, very much so. And, and what you can say a bit simplified is that in the scenarios where we are on top of, of uh, the cross here, um, there is a general different attitude towards consumption and especially of new products. Um, in the left part here, we believe that we would still consume products, new products, but a much from stronger recycled focus. Material. Yeah, from recycled materials, a much stronger focus on, on sustainable production whatever sustainable production is. Uh, whilst we here have a scenario where we actually have a decrease, especially in, in new products, so by recycling and reusing. Um, and that is kind of a lifestyle change that we think is correlated to the change of urgency that we as a society feel. Um, it's difficult to kind of uh, quantify that effect because all the prognosis that we have and the kind of quantity data we have shows a massive uh, increase in demand for products in general and, and thus transport. So it's, it's difficult to know if it's going to lead to actually a net decrease in this, but at least a relative decrease. Mm. But it's, yeah, we have discussed it quite a lot. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's important. So basically just be aware of these flows is, is a value uh, than you plan ahead for scenarios. You mean for transport providers or? I mean more like if, if I'm gonna use more recycled materials, would it be cause because I uh, pay per CO2 or is it that it's unregulated not to use more new materials or what will motivate the end consumer to mm. change behavior? Yeah, so one, one thing that we mentioned was this nudging uh, as, a, as a concept and then technologies for doing this. Uh, to the society. Uh, another thing that uh, in terms of uh, some, something that will change actually the, the business models is this uh, well, bonus malus uh, type of uh, policies uh, that will sort of uh, give tax benefits for uh, actors that are reducing CO2 or, or filling, uh, rising the fill rates and so on. And uh, in different scenarios uh, under different circumstances, one can sort of follow up on these uh, through digitization. But in this, uh, especially in this scenario, in the Paul Kemet 2.0, uh, we have kind of played around with the idea that there is really strong uh, tax increases on new production, so on, on, or actually on extracting raw materials. Whilst in some other of scenarios, we have more that it's actually whole life cycle CO2 emissions that are somehow priced. And that you can actually do that price priceation and have a dynamic pricing on the life cycle emissions of a product by using data. But th then we have to be in these scenarios where we have access to that data, and having that access is is challenging. Uh, so there are some different mechanisms. Both we have played around with market mechanisms and more like taxations and regulations. And you will find that more better <laughs> explained than I explain now in, in this one later. M m maybe one more business aspect, which is so far not in the report, but I will try to promote it, is that I think in order to share data, uh, there has to be more. It has to be, there has to be value for data uh, that is actually sort of trickles down to data providers based on the use. So I think there will be a data economy also that will be pre prevalent in different ends to different degrees. So the knowledge of, I don't know, traffic situation has a value and uh, based on how that knowledge is used, providers will be paid for this information. And uh, uh, on data platforms that are uh, completely automatic and the value will be estimated based on you know, the same way as stock market essentially. Any more questions here? No? Do we have any questions online right now? Don't nope. Okay, brilliant. Um, just uh, like to quickly mention, where's the slide disappeared to? Aha, yes. Uh, so um, 
next week, next Tuesday, uh, Rami from ITRL will be talking about business model innovation and um, the impacts um, of uh, the impacts of disruptive innovations on uh, business models. Um, so he'll be uh, discussing how disruptive innovations will impact um, current business models and uh, also be giving some suggestions for how businesses can uh, adapt to, to those, uh, those disruptions. <coughs> uh, so, yep, you can go online to the ITR website and uh, sign up to that seminar. I look forward to seeing some of you next week. And uh, now we're going to stop, but uh, we can mingle and have a little chat and ask these guys some more questions. Thank you. Thank you.